Good morning, friends, and welcome to this Thursday morning, or anytime Thursday, devotional from our author, Tom Wright. I'm David Fullen, the pastor of the Drakesboro and Jurgens Chapel United Methodist Churches, and it's my great privilege to be here passing on the scripture and Tom's reflections on it for us for this Lent. We're in week two, and this is the devotional for Thursday. The general reading is Matthew 12, 1 through 21, and we will focus on Matthew 12, verses 15 through 21. Those are the verses I'll be reading this morning beginning with verse 15, Jesus discovered the plots against him and left the district. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them all, giving them strict instructions not to tell people about him. This was so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might come true. Look, here's my servant whom I choose, or chose, rather, Look, here's my servant, whom I chose, my beloved one, my heart's delight. My spirit I will place on him, and he'll announce my justice to the whole wide world. He will not argue, nor will he lift up his voice and shout aloud. Nobody in the streets will hear his voice. He will not break the damaged reed or snuff the guttering lamp until his judgment wins the day. The world will hope upon his name. Oh, that's the last. The world will hope upon his name. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Here are some thoughts from Tom Wright. To get the full flavor of what's going on here, you should really read not just Matthew 12, but Isaiah 42 as a whole. Actually, even that isn't really enough because Isaiah 42 is a key passage within a much larger unity, Isaiah 40 through 55. Maybe you should set aside some time later on and read those 16 chapters right through. Imagine yourself in Matthew's congregation. Ask yourself what he's trying to tell you by quoting from that great prophecy. We have already seen that for Matthew and for Jesus himself, Jesus' public career was the fulfillment of the ancient prophecies. Not just fulfillment in the sense of a few random long-range predictions that were now at last coming true in an isolated fashion. Rather, fulfillment in the sense of a mountain climber who, after several days of hiking, sheer rock faces, ice flows, and so on, is now standing on the summit ridge with a peak of the mountain at last in sight. Fulfillment in the same sense, sorry, fulfillment in the sense of a couple who have endured a long engagement while one was called away on urgent business and who now, at last, can hear the wedding bells ringing as they make their way to the church. Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture in that sense. He brings its long winding story to the place where it was meant to go all along. When Matthew quotes these verses from Isaiah 42, he isn't just suggesting a distant resemblance between Jesus' commands to silence what we read in Matthew 12:16, and the humble behavior of Isaiah's servant of the Lord. He is indicating that this servant passage and others like it, which reach their their own climax with 
the ser- with the servant's death in chapter 53 are a key part of the buildup of the ancient story. <clears throat> it is all driving forward, looking eagerly ahead to an ultimate moment in which all the meaning built up over the centuries would be displayed in one extraordinary burst of fulfillment. Every bit of the servant prophecies points to Jesus. Matthew believed. Here, nearly halfway through his gospel, he wants to rub our noses in that fact. He could assume that many in his audience would know the whole section of Isaiah quite well, We, who probably don't know it quite so well, may need to catch up. The point he is making underneath it all is that is that of a different kind of kingdom, an alternative model of kingship. John the Baptist had misunderstood what Jesus was up to, hoping that he might be the sort of leader who would mount a rescue operation and get him out of prison and he had to be put right. James and John, later on in the story, were eager to have the best seats when Jesus became king, and they too needed to be put right. You can read about that in Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. In the same way, Matthew is keen to point out here that Jesus is redefining what God's kingdom looks like, and hence, what being God's Messiah might actually mean. In fact, of course, what he says here is exactly in line with the Sermon on the Mount. The meek will inherit the earth, and Jesus is leading the way. God's kingdom belongs to the humble, and Jesus is showing how it's done. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who suffer, are persecuted, and even killed because they are following God's way, and Jesus will go ahead of them in that. And Jesus will go ahead of them in that too. Matthew, by quoting this passage here, is pointing forwards all the way to the climax of his gospel when Jesus will be enthroned as King of the Jews by being nailed to a cross. There is, to be sure, great comfort for us in all of this. If God's kingdom came the same way that earthly kingdoms come, by force of arms and military victory, the weak and the vulnerable would once more come off worst. But God does things the other way up, and we should all be thankful for that. In our faith and discipleship, I'm sorry, we should all be thankful for that, In particular, those of us who struggle from time to time in our faith and discipleship should take heart from Isaiah's words applied here to Jesus. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick. His task and his delight is gently to fan into flames what was smoldering, gently to strengthen and firm up the weak, bruised, faith, hope, and love that we have at the moment. Let that be our prayer this Lent. Let me back up here just to that last little bit. There is, to be sure, great comfort for us in all of this. If God's kingdom came the same way that earthly kingdoms come, by force of arms and military victory. The weak and the vulnerable would once more come off worst. But God does things the other way up, and we should all be thankful for that. In particular, those of us who struggle from time to time in our faith and discipleship should take heart from Isaiah's words applied here to Jesus. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick. His task and his delight is gently to to fan into flames what was smoldering, gently to strengthen and firm up the weak, bruised faith, hope, 
and love that we have at the moment to strengthen and firm up the weak, bruised faith, hope, and love that we have at the moment. Let this be our prayer this Lent. Our prayer today, humble Lord Jesus, as you reach out to us in your gentle love, help us to find the way to bring your kingdom in our own day. Amen. Thank you, dear friends. I'll look for you tomorrow, Friday of week two.